Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our service of morning prayer. Special welcome to any visitors here with us this morning. Those who may be returning for the first time. Can you hear, all hear me all right? One or two are making signals. Need a bit more volume. Please. Is that any better? No? Who knows anything about the sound desk? <laughs> Should we have another go? Is that any better? No better? <laughs> a lot better. That's better. Right. <laughs> Perhaps a bit too loud now. Yeah, so I'll start it. Shall I start again, just in case you didn't hear what I said? Higher? Right. So welcome everyone to our service of morning prayer. Welcome to any visitors with us this morning and those who may be here for the first time since our services started again. Shall we just have a moment of quiet to still our hearts and our minds and to just acknowledge the Lord in our presence? And so this is the day that the Lord has made we choose to rejoice and be glad in it. Let all the earth acclaim God, sing to the glory of his name, come and see what God has done. Let the sound of his praise be heard. Blessed is God who has not withdrawn from us his love and care. The Lord be with you and also with you. So we come now to a time of confession when we call to mind those things which we have done and regret, or those things which we should have done but we haven't. Jesus says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So, Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We come now to our Bible readings. This is Susie first, and then Juliet. Our first reading is from Romans 14, verses 1 to 12. That's Romans 14, verses 1 to 12. Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarrelling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. One who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not, and the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. One person considers each day more sacred than another. Another considers each day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains 
does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives for ourselves alone and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. So whether you live or we die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the living and the dead. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. So then, each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, cancelled the debt and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him. Be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could repay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In his anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And now Matt will come and preach to us.
Good morning. Well, you can almost picture the scene in that gospel reading. Peter coming up to Jesus. Jesus, me and the me and the others we've been thinking. You remember a while back you were talking about forgiveness. Well, we think it's a great idea. Great plan. It's going to really make a massive difference in the world. But the thing is, well, there's got to be a limit, hasn't there? Because you can't just keep on forgiving and forgiving the same person. So, so we've had a bit of a chat and we've been thinking what the limit should be. So we've decided on seven. Seven times seems about right. Seven, a good number, days of creation and all that. What, what do you think of our, of our plan? And I can imagine Jesus shaking his head, chuckling to himself. Seven? 77 more like, or 70 times 70 times 70 times seven. I'm a bit sad that we don't get Peter's response to Jesus' answer. But last week, Maddie spoke about the unfairness of God's grace. And I wonder if Peter was thinking something similar here. How is it possibly fair that I have to forgive the same person over and over again? And and fair play to Peter, unlike other times, he has actually understood the main message, which is that he needs to forgive. But Jesus, in his reply, is saying, Peter, you've got a bit more thinking and learning to do. And instead of just giving Peter a straight answer, he then goes on. He uses this as an opportunity to disciple his disciples, to teach them more, to mold their character the parable he goes on to tell is probably familiar to most of us. As Jesus' parables go, it's quite straightforward in a way. A servant owes a king an outrageous amount of money with absolutely no way of being able to pay it back. The servant pleads with the king for more time to pay the money. But the king gives him even more than he asks for. He cancels the debt there and then. Servant goes off, bumps into another servant. This second servant owes the first servant a tiny amount of money. Second servant pleads with the first servant, but the first servant has him arrested. Well, then other servants see what's gone on. They tell the king, and the first servant is hauled back in front of the king and gets his comeuppance. All seems to be wrapped up neatly, justice is done. But why does Jesus tell this parable when he's already answered Peter's question? And as I thought about that question, it struck me that actually, as he so often does, Jesus is pointing upwards here. He takes a question from Peter that is about humanity and he gives an answer that points to God. Because forgiveness can only be discussed and considered in the context of God. Because it's through Jesus that God forgives us for the biggest of debts. He forgives us for each and every sin that we commit as humans, as human systems, as societies. Sins committed against God, against his people, against his creation. Forgiveness is part of the very nature of God. And Jesus can't talk about forgiveness without pointing back to God, the great forgiver. Two things I think are worth pointing out at this point. Firstly, this doesn't mean that Jesus is ignoring sin. Sin is wrong, evil is evil. Forgiveness is not about downplaying the sin. And in fact, the very passage before this one in Matthew's Gospel talks about Jesus addressing this issue of how to deal with with what happens when someone wrongs you. It's not about ignoring the sin. And the second thing I want to say is that I know that forgiveness is really hard. For some people, it will be incredibly painful to consider forgiving someone who has hurt them deeply. And I'm very aware that these are only a few short words on forgiveness this morning and won't address the depth of the issue. I hope you'll forgive me for that as we go on. But Jesus' parable can basically be summed up by one line of the Lord's Prayer. 
I'm sure you'll know it. Forgive us our debts or our sins or our trespasses as we have forgiven our debtors or as we forgive those who sin or trespass against us. And actually, this is the one line of the Lord's Prayer when he teaches it to his disciples that Jesus adds a little message about it afterwards. After he's taught the prayer, he says this, For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men when they sin against you, your Father will not forgive your sins. Jesus wants this message to be clear. We are to forgive each other because that's the only adequate response to God's forgiveness of us. C.S. Lewis puts it like this. To be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. God doesn't need to forgive us. He doesn't have to forgive us, but he does. And we need that forgiveness. The servant in the parable pleads with the king for a chance to pay back the money, to cover the debt himself. But the amount of money being talked about here, there was absolutely no way that that servant could ever have paid back that debt. I don't even know how realistic it would have been for a servant to have owed a king that much money. I wonder then if Jesus is actually exaggerating to make a point. His point being that our wrongs against God are mountainous and we can't make them right ourselves. There is no way we can pay it off in our own strength. We have to seek God's forgiveness and grace. And then in that response, as a response to that forgiveness, we have to be willing to forgive those who do wrong to us. Forgiveness then is commanded by God. In a sense, that should be the end of the story, the end of my words this morning. But we are human. And I think when we think about forgiveness, there is that feeling sometimes of, well, is it fair? Is it right? Why should I do this? Why should I forgive someone who insults me or wrongs me, attacks me, harms me or someone I love? Particularly if they don't apologize or show remorse for what they've done. How is that fair? Where is the justice in that? So a couple of quick thoughts to maybe help us counter those feelings. Firstly, when we look for justice, we have to remember mercy. Earlier in the year, I read a quote in a book that has stuck with me. It's from an American pastor called John Mark Comer. He writes this, Most of us want mercy for ourselves and justice for everyone else. But it doesn't work like that, as God shows mercy to all. I was really challenged by those words. I think our society has become one that wants justice for everyone else, but but mercy and forgiveness for ourselves. That is not God's way. It's there in those famous words from the prophet Micah. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. So do we need to love mercy more? Will that help us to be quicker to forgive? I'll leave that with you to ponder. And secondly, there's been a phrase that's kept coming back to me as I've read this passage and thought about it and prayed about it. The phrase is this, forgiveness is about freedom. And that doesn't mean that forgiveness is easy or comfortable, but it is freeing. And we all want to be free. It's freeing both for the person doing the forgiving and the person receiving forgiveness. Philip Yancey, in his, in his book, What's So Amazing About Grace, says this, Forgiveness breaks the cycle of blame and loosens the stranglehold of guilt. I really like that picture of what forgiveness does. It breaks the cycle of blame and loosens the stranglehold of guilt. In a unique way, forgiveness manages to free and separate the innocent party from the wound that they received. 
And forgiveness in a unique way manages to free and separate the guilty party from the sin they've committed. Nothing else can do that. It has a unique and transforming power. As I pondered this idea of forgiveness about freedom, I was brought back to the simple truth that God knows what he's doing. Jesus knew what he was doing when he responded to Peter. He knew what Peter needed to hear. He wasn't laying down the law, but he was pointing Peter and the disciples and us to freedom. The servant in the parable was given freedom, but in refusing to offer that freedom to his other servant, he effectively rejects the freedom he was given by the king. For us to be free, we have to be willing to forgive as we have been forgiven. So I challenge for you to take away. Next time you pray the Lord's Prayer, either this morning in a few minutes or later through the week, just linger on that line about forgiveness. Remember that Jesus highlighted it for special attention in Matthew 6. And just consider who you might need to forgive. Because we forgive because he's forgiven us. Lord, help us to forgive as you have forgiven us. Amen. Thank you for those words, Matt. I just want us to take a moment and just think about what's been said before we start our intercessions. We're going to be using the Psalms for, to guide us in our prayers this morning. Um, we're going to start the prayers with um, a theme, and then I'm going to read the Psalm and give us time to just pray individually to God before we move on to the next area. The first area is thankfulness, and the Psalm for this area is Psalm 84, verses 10 to 12. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than live in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. He bestows favour and honour. No good thing does the Lord withhold from those who walk uprightly. Our Lord of hosts Happy is everyone who trusts in you. Let us pray. Our second area is forgiveness, and the psalm we'll be using for this is Psalm 51, verses 1 to 12. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. 
for I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone, I have sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me through hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore me to the joy of your salvation and sustain me in a willing spirit. Let us pray. Our last area we will be praying into is help. The psalm for this area is Psalm 42, verses 1 and 5. As a deer longs for flowing streams, O oh my soul longs for you, O God. Why are you cast down, O oh my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my help. Let us pray. Father, you hear all our prayers, so as we close this time of prayer, let us pray as our Saviour taught us. We say together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
So would you like to please stand if you're able and we'll say the words of the creed together. Let us declare our faith in God. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please sit down. So before the blessing, I'll just give out some notices. Um, <clears throat> please do, uh, can I encourage you, please do read the notices that you receive online. If you're not receiving them online or through the post, please see Jen after the service. And uh, you'll be pleased to hear that places of worship are exempt from the new rule of six. So, all being well, there will be a service here next Sunday morning at nine o'clock. We just have to watch the space. We're not quite sure our way from day to day. Please remember to fill in your track and trace forms that are in the pew and place them in the baskets as you leave. And as you leave the south aisle, please go through the chapel door center I'll go through the main entrance or exit and those in the south aisle um, through the chapel door so please take care everyone so may the Lord bless us and watch over us the Lord make his face shine upon us and be gracious to us the Lord look kindly on us and give us peace and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst us and remain with us always. Amen.